Burnout in healthcare is multifactorial. You will find that there are many reasons or possible causes or risk factors for burnout for an individual. And some of them get a lot of attention, but there are others that are just as important that don't get talked about nearly enough. And so in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about three different areas that I feel don't get very much attention within pharmacy, but do contribute to pharmacist burnout. So the first risk factor or cause of burnout that I don't think is discussed enough is drug shortages. Even 10 years ago, drug shortages were not nearly the problem that we are seeing today. There have been multiple instances in the past several years that have shown us that our drug market is pretty unstable. So the first big incident that I remember in my career was in 2017 when Puerto Rico was hit by Hurricane Maria. There was so much devastation with that event, and one of the devastating facts was, aside from the people who were on the island, which was more than enough devastation, there were many people who were killed, didn't have power or running water, and had many injured and other health implications because of the lack of resources that were available. We piled on top of drug shortage because there was a facility in Puerto Rico that was responsible for a significant amount of the sterile sodium chloride production. So these are IV bags that we use all the time in the hospital. I mean, almost everyone who comes through the ER ends up with a NS bag in them. I mean, it's just one of the things that happens a lot, especially for dehydration and just fluid replenishment. It's also a base for many of our other IV medications that we produce and compound. So when you eliminated the manufacturing facility in Puerto Rico, there was a huge shortage in the United States from that event. Another recent event was in 2022 when the COVID-19 pandemic shut down a plant in China that was responsible for the majority of the world's contrast dye production. Contrast dye is used for many different diagnostic tests and many facilities were having to decide who was actually going to get the contrast dye for their test because there wasn't enough to go around. And most recently, we are only a few days out at the time of this recording from the tornado that hit the Pfizer warehouse and manufacturing facility in North Carolina. At this time, we don't know exactly what the implications of this will be, but it is very likely there will be drug shortages from this. The damage was mostly done in a warehouse, and thank goodness nobody was hurt. Uh, If you have seen the videos, it is pretty shocking the state that that facility is in right now. And honestly, it's amazing that more people weren't hurt or killed in that incident in that location in particular. And I know that there are a lot of employees that did work there that lost their houses. And that is incredibly sad. But as far as the implications for healthcare as a whole, it was the warehouse that got hit the hardest. So they are still having to inspect their manufacturing facilities, but hopefully those are undamaged. But all of the medications that were in that warehouse were impacted and they're still trying to figure out exactly how that is going to impact the drug supply chain. And then aside from these three incidents, there are plenty of others and many that are not caused by natural disasters at all, but rather the decision to stop making it all together or some sort of issue with the manufacturing plant that stops production. So how does something like this cause burnout in a pharmacist? Well, for those who are working front lines with patients, You can imagine the anger and frustration that a patient might have if they have been on a medication for 5, 10, 15 years and they come to the counter one day and the pharmacist tells them that they couldn't fill their medication because there's a shortage of that medication or maybe even it's no longer being made and they can't get it at all and they're going to have to switch to something else. Unfortunately, the phone calls or conversations that happen at the counter with patients about this type of thing can cause the patient to take that out on the pharmacist. And I know that they likely aren't meaning to, and pharmacists have no control over this. We're just as frustrated as every single patient is, but they're who's there. And so technicians and pharmacists who are relaying this information often get the backlash. So this type of behavior can contribute to burnout just because it's one more thing for people to be angry at the pharmacist for that they have no control over whatsoever. Not only that, it's the response that has to be put into place, and that causes a significant administrative burden. Research has shown in healthcare workers that non-clinical task and basically administrative task, doing extra paperwork, having to do additional charting, anything that really pulls away a healthcare worker from their clinical duties 
can increase their risk of burnout because that's not what they signed up for. Nobody signed up to deal with drug shortages. Yes, I want to manage drug shortages. That is why I want to be a pharmacist. That's not what we're here to do. That's not what we want to do. But yet there is a large portion of pharmacists that are having to deal with this on a regular basis. And it's becoming more and more common for healthcare systems to have meetings weekly, monthly, or bi-weekly to discuss medication shortages that are happening and how that's impacting patient care. And then you have the frontline staff who's having to keep up with all of these drug shortages and manage them as the orders come in for those medications, speaking with healthcare providers about alternative options as well. And then we have the ethical dilemma of drug shortages. When you are a pharmacist and you know that there is a medication out there that exists and it can help somebody, but you do not have the ability to access it for whatever reason, and you have to tell a provider that you can't give them that medication for the fact that it just doesn't exist, that really sucks. The other thing that is very hard is when you are in an allocation state where some patients are deemed not sick enough to receive certain medications or they are not the right population to get it because they're not the worst of the worst, even if it could have helped them, you as the pharmacist or that gatekeeper that says, no, we cannot fill this order because they don't meet our allocation requirements right now. I have been in that position and it really, 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 really sucks. Nobody wants to deny anybody treatment that is going to make them better, even if we understand it's for the greater good because we don't have another option. Numerous times throughout my pharmacy training, we took the oath of the pharmacist, and then that final time when you graduate, you say it one more time, and this time it really sticks, because this time after that day, you're a pharmacist. When I took the oath of the pharmacist, I did not take an oath to allocate drugs to patients because there's shortages because of the greed of some of these drug manufacturers who decide to stop producing medications in order to save their budget because they're not making a big profit off of these life-saving treatments. But here we are. Those ethical dilemmas come into play as far as burnout goes. It's really, there's a mismatch between what you're doing at work and having to do at work to take care of patients and your moral code and desire to help people. And they're conflicting in those cases. That sort of internal tension is a risk factor for burnout. The next factor that I want to talk about is along a similar train of thought as far as the administrative burden that it causes, as well as the ethical concerns. And some of you are probably already wondering if I'm going to say this if you work in community pharmacy, pharmacy benefit managers and insurance. Most people know what insurance is and how it plays into this. I'm going to focus a little bit heavier into pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. So if you're not familiar with pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs are essentially middlemen between the pharmacy, the drug manufacturer, and then the insurance company that a patient has. And when they were created many years ago, the thought process behind having pharmacy benefit managers was to reduce drug cost and pass that on to patients. The way that this would work is these pharmacy benefit managers were large conglomerates. They would represent numerous different health insurances and be able to negotiate because they have better negotiation power because there's a larger population of patients under many different insurance companies. So when they went to a drug manufacturer, they had more negotiation power to reduce the drug cost. Think of it like bulk Costco. They were able to get those bulk prices on drugs to reduce the cost. In theory, this should have reduced cost of medications for patients. But since PBMs have been enacted, we have seen the opposite because what has happened is a lot of those drug cost savings are going to the pharmacy benefit managers and not patients. And because of a lack of regulatory oversight of pharmacy benefit managers, it has caused a lot of issues for just keeping the doors open within a pharmacy. And as you can imagine, any sort of financial stress increases your risk for burnout. But with a lot of pharmacies, what has happened is... There are numerous things in place, and I'm not going to go crazy into the details with PBMs, but there are places where pharmacists are losing significant amount of money for the scripts that they're filling. Yes, they are not making money off of these prescriptions. They are truly losing money because these pharmacy benefit managers are not paying them enough money to cover the cost of the drug, nor are they providing enough money to cover dispensing fees, which is part of the drug cost as well. 
So it's financially difficult for many pharmacies to stay open under these PBMs because they are taking away so much money and they're losing money filling prescriptions. Pharmacy benefit managers frequently interfere with a pharmacist's ability to provide patient care. This happens on a number of different scales, one of which being that many times the pharmacy benefit managers are dictating what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for and how much this is going to cost patients. So again, that copay could be higher than the cash price for patients. That makes it harder to care for them. You also have many instances where they're trying to get prior authorizations put in place for medications, even if the patient has already tried it before and there's historical documents of that, they want them to try it again. And you have to go through the prior authorization process, which requires going back to the physician, and then the pharmacy can't fill the medication because of the cost until that prior authorization goes through. And it just makes it more difficult for a patient to get the medications that they need. The other practice that makes it difficult on pharmacies and causes more burnout and stress in a pharmacist's life is the steering that happens with pharmacy benefit managers. If you've ever been told that you could not fill your medications at a specific pharmacy because it was not within your plan, that is the kind of steering we're talking about. Back when I was a resident, I had insurance that was through CVS's PBM, and I was told that I could not fill my medication at the pharmacy of my choice and I had to fill it through mail order. They told me that they would stop paying for my monthly medications and that they would not override that for any reason or cause even if the mail was delayed. So even though I had found a pharmacy that was on my way home that I really liked and actually enjoyed going in there every month to pick up my medications, I was not allowed to use that pharmacy anymore if I wanted my medication covered. And this has happened to a lot of people who have had the same pharmacist for years and go to a community pharmacy that's, you know, owned by the pharmacist and it's kind of a family business. And there are many, many people who are in the position now that they cannot choose what pharmacy they would to go to, or they don't know the methods that they need to take in order to get around that because it's not something that's easy to do. So while I do agree there are benefits to mail order and there are people who can and should use that. There are also many difficulties for patients who are trying to navigate this who may want to use a specific pharmacy or like a specific pharmacy, and they're just simply being told their medications won't be covered there. When it comes down to it, pharmacy benefit managers do increase the risk of burnout for pharmacists for that administrative burden and especially the ethical principles where PBMs choose profits over patients and pharmacists are there to help patients, to take care of patients. We've taken an oath to take care of patients, and everything that these PBMs do and stand for pretty much goes against that. I would have loved to see pharmacy benefit managers function the way they were intended when they were put into place. I would have loved to see them decrease the cost of medications for patients. I would have loved to see them improve the quality of medications because there's somebody else holding these drug manufacturers accountable. And it would be great if they had working relationships with pharmacies that improved them. But the sad reality is that is not how pharmacy benefit managers function in the United States healthcare system. So the third burnout risk factor or cause that I want to discuss within pharmacy that's not talked about enough is technology. Technology and healthcare in general is discussed a lot in the setting of burnout because it is so complicated to work in the technology systems that are built in healthcare. But many of the conversations that come up around technology in healthcare really focus on physicians and nurses. And I have rarely heard about pharmacists in this conversation and how these same technology barriers impact them. So the positives of the technology that we have in place in healthcare is that you know, I work in a hospital, I have access to a patient's chart, I don't have to go upstairs, grab their paper chart, maybe somebody has it, and I don't have access to it whenever I'm filling prescriptions. I have access to a lot of information. The other benefit is we can do e-prescribing and there are easier ways to transfer medication prescriptions to a pharmacy than there used to be. Like it's incredibly easy for a patient to refill a prescription now. If you have your prescription number, you just type that in and it goes into an electronic system and you're good to go. You don't have to worry about people losing paper prescriptions or just losing paper chart information and you also don't have to deal with as much bad handwriting but there are a lot of negatives 
to technology in the way it was implemented in healthcare because there was legislation put in place that caused a lot of the systems that were created to be rushed and don't follow human-centered design at all. They just were meeting the specifications needed, not for patient care, but for billing purposes. So much of how electronic medical records were set up were simply to make it easier to figure out what to bill for and to bill at the highest ability. So billing for every little thing that happens because there's documentation to support it. Healthcare is one of the only sectors where implementation of technology actually increased the workload for the people who are working within that space. Working in a health system, some of the things that I noticed that happened with this technology is there's just so much documentation to sort through. Because it's quote unquote easier to chart this information, people do like a copy paste feature of yesterday's notes Sometimes that means there's incorrect information in there. Things have changed and nobody updated that note. They just copied yesterday's note and forgot to change that information. That also means because they can easily copy paste, there's a lot of information in maybe a note or a chart that is not relevant for that day. And it's harder to find the changes or relevant information when you are looking through a patient's chart. With the time constraints that are in place already with working within this healthcare system, that means important information does get missed. One of the difficult things about the systems that have been put in place with healthcare is that they do not talk to each other well. There is no interoperability in many of the systems that are created. So when electronic medical records were put into place, the hope would be that these would talk to each other. So it wouldn't matter if you have Cerner or Meditech or Epic that you would be able to access the information for one patient no matter what kind of charting system was used at another institution. But what we've seen, if somebody is using Epic in one location and they're transferred to somebody who has Cerner, there is not an easy way for that information to be communicated between these systems. Even within systems that have the same electronic medical record, if they're not set up appropriately, you still can't transfer information. I ran into this all the time when I was working on the floor in the NICU because we would get patients who transferred into our facility. We didn't have a birthing center where I was doing residency. So we'd have these NICU babies come in and we were trying to see, did they get antibiotics? Did they get their Hep B vaccine? Did they get vitamin K? Did they get erythromycin eye ointment? What else did they receive while they were there fluid-wise so we can start working on getting them the right medications on board? And what we found was frequently even systems that were supposed to talk to each other didn't. And that meant I was trying to call records or I was trying to call a pharmacy somewhere else. And when you have somebody that's in such critical condition, those minutes matter. And sometimes these issues, if we couldn't get across to somebody, meant somebody got duplicate antibiotics. That means delays in treatment if it was going to be dangerous to give something twice. Those are problems. And then again, that administrative burden comes in where we're spending a lot of time focused on trying to get the paperwork we need or the information we need to take care of a patient than actually getting to take care of the patient themselves. Another piece of this is the implementation of prescription drug monitoring programs. If you're not familiar with a PDMP, these are designed in order to see the controlled substance prescriptions that have been filled, when they were filled, where they were filled, how frequently they are being filled, what's the normal dose. These were put in place because of the opioid epidemic, and there are many benefits to them. However, the way they are set up right now, they do not function very well with most electronic medical record systems, or that is something that was an afterthought, so they're currently in the process of being implemented, and who knows when that will happen. And same thing with people who are checking prescriptions and a dispensing software. There's no interoperability there, so you're having to go to another system that is often not set up very well, a different login, and you're supposed to check every time, but because of security purposes, it logs you out and it just becomes a whole mess. But it's illegal if you don't check it. So that's just another example of where interoperability would be amazing. In some places, they're starting to implement this more and more. However, it's just not there across the board yet. I mentioned earlier that you have less issues of having bad handwriting and not being able to read a prescription or misreading a prescription. But now with the way many of the ordering systems work for prescriptions, physicians can easily select the wrong thing on a dropdown or they can accidentally 
you know, start typing a drug, click the wrong thing and don't even realize it. And the patient can get a wrong medication that way. So this type of technology did not eliminate human error. It just created a different way for human error to occur. Hopefully in many cases, the technology has some sort of built in safeguards to help prevent that, but not always. Another piece of the technology burn in is the multiple communication lines that happen within healthcare. So you have your email and then you have like Teams messaging, chat messaging. If you're in a health system frequently, that is something you have available. There may be medication request portals. There may be a chat feature in your electronic medical record and you have your phone. So you have all of these different communication methods and sometimes it's hard to keep all of that straight and it can be very distracting to the pharmacy team because they're getting so much communication all the time from various locations and it's easy for things to get missed. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was the fear that AI or technology is going to replace pharmacist jobs. Right now, we don't really know where this technology is going and what it's going to be capable of in the future. So there is that concern or risk that AI is going to take over part of the job. I feel like first it's going to be technicians with automated filling and that we're going to use technicians in a different way than we have in the past. But where that's going, we don't know. And that's a fear for many people. I hope that the AI technology will first be beneficial and pharmacist will be just used in a different way. But it's an uncertainty area and uncertainty increases stress, which increases your risk of burnout. So there you have it. Those are three different causes of burnout for pharmacists that aren't frequently talked about. If you have other ones that you think might fit into this category, leave them in the comments. As always, thank you for watching. And until next time, keep on living your happy farm life. Bye. Thank you.